Hello, my name is Peter Houston, and this is an overview of a collection of ancient and medieval coins that we currently have at the Mount Royal University Archives and Special Collections. Uh, I just want to give you a sense of some of the coins that are in this sort of small but interesting teaching collection, and uh, in invite you to come take a look if you're ever interested. Uh, we're going to start with this. This is one of the oldest coins in the collection. Uh, it's really more of a proto coin in that it, it's it's not a, a true coin it doesn't have sort of a heads and tails or as numismatists those who study uh, coins say uh, obverse and reverse um, it is the same on both sides uh, and you can see it's it's a it's about the size of a nickel and it's made out of copper and it's in the shape of a dolphin um, this this coin comes from uh, the sort of Greek colony of Olbia uh, an important Greek port on the Black Sea and what's now what's now Ukraine, very close to Kherson. Uh, this was a thriving port. A lot of trade went through here between you know the the uh, Greek states and and the Sarmatians and Scythians that sort of live lived in in what's now uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and so yeah, a major port city um, right on the Black Sea. And, and they started minting their own coins in about 500 BCE and continuing, continued producing these, these dolphin-shaped uh, coins for about 200 years. Uh, you can see they're, they're cute little things. They've got like, like the um, Black Sea dolphins on which they're based. You can see it's got like a little bottle nose, a bit of an eye, a dorsal fin. Uh, so these would have been used in, in sort of everyday trade um, in this, this Greek port city kind of on the the far-flung edges of the Hellenistic world. Uh, we're moving forward in time here. We're, we're going to look at two coins from the uh, the Greek Seleucid Empire. Uh, in Well, I'll give some background. So we've all heard of Alexander the Great, who, you know, through these uh, massive and very successful military campaigns, uh, managed to conquer a world-spanning empire. Uh, he was originally, you know, king of Macedonia from sort of the northern part of Greece. Um, but by the end of his reign and his very short life, he died in his 20s, um, he had conquered, or his, his empire uh, that he mostly achieved through conquest um, extended all the way from Greece to like the Indus Valley and what's now India. Um, so an absolutely massive uh, empire. When he died, he died of disease when visiting the city of Babylon, uh, which he he captured, of course, um, his generals took to fighting each other over kind of the remnants of, of this empire and broke it up into, into pieces. And so one of the uh, most successful of those, those generals of Alexander was a guy known as Seleucus. Um, this is one of his coins. So Seleucus I, there was a whole line of, of Seleucid uh, emperors. So he managed to, sort of in a series of civil wars with his co-generals uh, managed to uh, seize a very large part of sort of the eastern section of Alexander's empire and uh, and set up a, a very long-running empire of his own, the Seleucid Empire, named after him. Um, so this coin, uh, it doesn't depict Seleucus. This, this bearded figure that we see here is actually Zeus, you know, king of the gods in Olympus, sort of the most important figure in the Greek uh, pantheon of, of gods. Uh, so we have uh, Zeus's head on the one side. This is very common for ancient Greek coinage to have not the head of like the current ruler of you know the Greek city-state that's producing them, but to have a, a divine figure, sort of a god that you know maybe is associated closely with with the uh, the Greek polity producing these these coins. Um, and, and on the other side, on the reverse, sort of the back of the coin, uh, this funny shaped thing is actually, it's a, a lightning bolt with wings. Uh, again, you know, lightning bolt, Zeus was the god of, of you know, thunder and lightning, so it's one of his attributes. Uh, so you can see the Greeks really making use of like divine imagery, religious imagery um, on their coins. So this one's from about 300 BCE, and, and again from the Seleucid Empire, this Greek-speaking empire that uh, spanned a lot of what's now kind of the, the Middle East um, and beyond, really. Here's another Seleucid coin. This one comes from uh, the reign of Seleucus IV. So 
You know, this is about 120 or so years after Seleucus the first, or so, sorry, Seleucus the first established the empire. Uh, so this is one of his his um, descendants. Uh, we actually have on the right hand image the the reverse under the that's the prow of a ship, like a, a galley, probably a war galley, um, representing the Seleucid Empire's kind of maritime and naval might. Uh, but right underneath that, in Greek, we have we have the name of the the emperor, um, you know, the Seleucid uh, uh, monarch Seleucus is is right under there. Uh, the other the other image, uh, the obverse, the heads uh, side of the coin, doesn't show the emperor again. You know, the Greeks, I mean, with some exceptions, Alexander put his own image on his coins, but a lot of even even the Greek rulers that came after him didn't. Uh, so this is also a god. This is uh, an, sort of a side portrait of Apollo, um, the god of you know the sun, of light, of uh, beauty and music. So a very another very important uh, sort of deity. Um, note the funny shape of these coins. This was something I think fairly unique to the Seleucid Empire. They only did it for a very short period of time. But they produce these coins with with these funny bumps all around the edges, uh, sometimes referred to now as as bottle cap coins. Numismatists, again, th those are the people that study uh, ancient coins. Well, not just ancient coins, but any coins. Um, you know, have a number of theories why they bothered with this strange kind of shape. Uh, one one theory is that um, maybe as a way to discourage counterfeiting, as it's, it's harder to produce a shape like this, but not entirely sure. Anyways. All right, let's fast forward and look at uh, some Roman coins now. So this is where the bulk of the collection that we have here at Mount Royal University uh, really lies, is in sort of Roman imperial coinage. So the coins officially issued by the Roman emperors and the Roman imperial state. Uh, and this is a good example of one. This is a third century Cistertia, so a large copper coin that would have been, uh, you know, regularly exchanged all across the empire. Um, the Roman imperial state uh, had a number of, of coin mints, so these are kind of like coin producing factories across the empire that were producing these things in great numbers to meet the sort of trade and currency needs of, you know, this this vast empire and and its you know trading partners. Um, you'll see a few differences between this and the older Seleucid coins that came before. Here we have on the obverse we have uh, the head of the the current emperor. So this is a living monarch portrayed in a coin, which again I was saying, you know Alexander the Great did this, but it wasn't. It only it took the Romans, the Roman imperial state, before this became kind of common practice to show the head of state. You know, much like how today we're going to be having, uh, you know, King Charles on our, our currency. Um, this was sort of a, I don't know, the Romans really took this and and sort of solidified this tradition. So here we have the emperor Maximinus, also known as Maximinus Thrax, due to the fact that he came from uh, Thrace. Uh, I think this is a very realistic looking portrait, you know, with this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, pointy, prominent chin. He's wearing a laurel wreath, a symbol of his imperial authority. You can see the coin is well worn. Um, ancient coins tended to stay in, in circulation uh, for a very long time, um, to the point where sometimes the faces of, you know, of the emperor and gods would be completely effaced from, you know, just from being handled by that many people. So yeah, so we have got the, you know, Maximinus, the emperor's image on the one side with all of his titles in, in Latin around him. And then on the other side, we have a, uh, a, a goddess. We have, it says Salus Augusti, um, and we can see Salus, who is the Roman uh, goddess of, of health, of medicine, uh, feeding a snake that's rising out of an altar. Um, and Salus Augusti means sort of health of the of the most august one, health of Augustus, referring back to Maximinus. So this is depicting kind of a personification of the health and well-being of the head of state. So I am not going to show more of the Roman imperial coins besides this one, just because I have 
a separate video where I focus at length on the Roman imperial coinage in this collection. So if you're interested, feel free to check out that other, uh, that other uh, video. But I want to now move on to some, these are, are also Roman coins, but these are Roman provincial issues. So generally the Roman state itself was responsible for, you know, minting coins, much like our, our you know, our federal government is responsible for minting coinage that we use in Canada today. So the Roman imperial state was, except on kind of the fringes of empire, uh, there were, I don't know, different provincial authorities out in the Roman provinces were allowed to mint their own coins as long as they were just minting sort of the lower denomination coins, uh, generally just the copper coinage. Very occasionally uh, silver coins were minted by, by out in the provinces. Uh, by provincial authorities, um, but never gold coins. That was like an imperial prerogative. Uh, so a lot of these these provincial coins were minted in the eastern parts of the empire where Greek was the common language, despite it being the Roman Empire. And so we see that reflected here. The inscriptions on this coin are a little hard to see because it's it's uh, not the in the best condition. Um, but if, if you can make out letter forms, uh, the entire inscriptions are in Greek, which is very different than, than most Roman coinage, which had Latin inscriptions. Uh, on the one side, we have the, uh, the bust of the emperor. This is Trebonia, uh, Treb, Trebonianus Gallus, sorry, uh, from, he was uh, two emperors after the previous guy that we saw, Maximinus. So we have, you know, this very powerful looking image of the emperor wearing his laurel wreath. Uh, and, but then on the other side, um, we have this kind of stylized eagle, um, which, you know, is a, a, of course, a very important symbol of Rome and her military might, uh, but also a symbol of, of Jupiter, you know, the Roman equivalent of Zeus, king of the gods. So very popular on a lot of Roman coinage. Um, this coin and the next one you're going to see in just a moment were minted in Antioch, uh, which is now in Turkey, uh, just near the border with, with uh, Syria. So, so sort of southern Turkey, close to the Mediterranean coast. Uh, this Antioch had been founded by uh, Seleucus, the, the uh, uh, ruler that we saw back, you know, with the, the coin of um, Zeus and the, the winged uh, lightning bolt or thunderbolt. Um, so he had founded Antioch, and by this, this time in the Roman Empire in the third century, Antioch was a thriving uh, sort of center of trade and, and really of like Hellenistic, so sort of Greek culture. Um, so a very important place in the Roman Empire. Uh, and here is another coin also from Antioch. This one is the same emperor, Trebonianus Tri Gallus. Um, but the reason I want to show you this was uh, provincial coinage is interesting in that it often will feature a um, motifs and designs uh, imagery that's significant to the place where it was minted. So that's the case here. So on the, the reverse, the right-hand image, we have uh, a statue of the sort of patron city goddess of Antioch, uh, Tyche, um, and specific form of Tyche, Tyche on the Rontes, which is the river that flows through Antioch. Um, so uh, this is a shrine to Tyche, who's sitting there. She's wearing a helm, uh, it's not a helmet, uh, a crown that looks like the city's walls. And at her feet is a, is a figure of the river god Orontes, um, sort of representing that, that local river. So, you know, this was, this is depicting a local shrine um, that Antioch was well known for. And so, you know, just like how, say, Roman emperors would um, try to kind of uh, portray themselves on their coins or portray things that were important to, uh, you know, to their their uh, leadership or to sort of Roman national identity. So these provincial coins to say something about sort of uh, identity in the Roman provinces. So moving along then, uh, here are just a... a it's a handful, a literal handful, that's my hand for scale, uh, of, of Byzantine coins. So these are copper coins minted in the Byzantine Empire, which uh, of course is the, the sort of eastern part of the Roman Empire, which continued on 
long you know for another millennium after western the western part of the empire uh fell um and so these these coins with the exception of the one in the top left hand corner are all minted in like the sixth and seventh century of uh, uh ce and so i i wanted to show you there's there's been a real transition here with the design of these coins you can see a lot of christian imagery on them which reflects the fact that you know by this point uh the byzantine the roman empire and the byzantine empire you know that followed it had been had been christian for centuries so you see a lot of that religious imagery appearing on the coins um if we zoom in a little you can see this down here is this this green coin down here uh it's green because it's copper and it kind of forms a, a patina or kind of rust as it oxidizes um, but this is an image of the emperor i believe this is justin the first and he's holding a, a very christian symbol of kingship it's a, a globe representing the world surmounted by a cross um, this other symbol on the coin just to the left of it the smallest coin on the bottom uh, is is a, a christogram it's a uh, represents um, or it's you know an early Christian symbol for Christ it's the first two letters of um, Christ's name uh, in Greek Christos so it's sort of an X and what looks like a P superimposed on one another and and yeah you often see this on on Greek coinage or sorry Byzantine coinage uh, along with you know crosses and other other Christian religious imagery like the ancient Romans that immediately preceded the Byzantines, the, the Byzantine state kept up with uh, putting on portraits of, of the emperors, living emperors. And so, uh, but, but this is a bit of a departure here. You can see some of these coins have two figures and they're not just like kind of a head and shoulders bust, but uh, an entire seated figure. So this is the emperor and empress sitting side by side. Uh, and, and then, Another thing to note too is uh, we have different denominations of coins here. So the, the basic unit of Byzantine currency was the numus. So the bottom one with the, the Christogram on it, uh, that is that would be five numi, uh, whereas the, the three smaller greenish coins above it, uh, those are like 20 numi pieces. And then the one larger one sort of to the right, that's a, a phallus, which would be 40 numi. So you can see a bit of the... Uh, I don't know, the, the different denominations of Byzantine currency here. The last coin up at the top left uh, is, is significantly newer than the rest of these. Uh, this is, I believe, like a 12th century um, kind of concave shaped coin known as a tractate or cup coin. Uh, these, these were minted much later in, in the Byzantine uh, period. So, But again, with I'm not sure if that's the emperor or a saint. But again, a lot of Christian religious imagery on, on the coinage of this Eastern Christian empire. So. Oh yeah, I want to show you this. Uh, so most of the examples that I'm showing you are from, from Europe, from you know Mediterranean Europe, or a few from Western Europe, some from sort of the Christian East. Um, this is, is a bit different. This one, I thought it kind of paired nicely with those those uh, 6th and 7th century Byzantine coins we were looking at, because this is a coin from the Sasanian Empire, uh, an Iranian empire that was one of the Byzantine Empire's chief rivals. So this is a big, beautiful silver coin about the size of a loony. And on the one side, we have uh, an image of the king of, or the, yeah, the Sasanian king, uh, Khosrow II, wearing this fantastic headpiece with you know wings and all sorts of jewelry you can tell you know he's uh yeah i mean there's a, there's a real propaganda element to a lot of i mean has been through you know throughout history on coinage and so you, i think you can see that as at play here um you know there's there's so much so much symbolism just showing like the majesty of this supreme emperor of you know the sasanian uh empire which which was uh, a massive and very successful empire um for quite some time. Khosrow II came near the end of the Sasanian Empire, uh, so he, sort of under his leadership, uh, he unleashed a, a, a initially very successful war against the Byzantines that took his armies right up to the Byzantine capital of Constantinople, um, which they ultimately 
did not were not able to take. And the Byzantines unleashed a counterattack that uh, eventually was to be Khosrow's undoing. Um, his his uh, armies were put to flight. Much of the land that he'd taken from the Byzantines was recaptured. And uh, in the end, his, his, own, his own empire was so destabilized that one of his sons imprisoned and executed him, uh, which set off kind of a series of civil wars, which basically spelled the end of the Sasanian Empire. Um, if you look at the reverse, uh, what you're seeing here, it's a little hard to make out, but it's a, a Zoroastrian fire altar. So this was the last of the Iranian states to have Zoroastrianism as its, as its state religion. So we've got this fire altar, and on both sides there's attendants or priests wearing these kind of headdresses uh, that are, are sort of looking after this, after this altar. Um, after Khosrow's reign, you know, there was a brief succession of sort of less successful and less long-lived uh, Sasanian rulers, and then uh, the Sasanian Empire was, was invaded um, by uh, Muslim Arab armies that ultimately uh, took over the empire and established um, Islam in, in Iran. So an interesting coin with a lot of history behind it. All right, going briefly back to the Byzantines, this is a much later Byzantine issue. There was a period of about 120 years in the 11th century, or around the 11th century, when the Byzantines kind of changed things up. Uh, instead, of, instead of portraying their emperors on their coinage, uh, for, during this period, all their coinage um, had uh, the, the figure of Christ um, on, on the coinage. This is one of the first appearances of, of Jesus on coinage. Um, so here on you know the obverse side, the head side, uh, we have uh, Christ looking forward. It's like a straight-on portrait. He's got his halo. He's carrying that thing that he's holding with all the bumps on it. That's uh, his like gospel book. Uh, and on the other side, we have a large cross. Um, and then there's a, a inscription in Greek that says like Jesus Christ, uh, King of Kings. Um, so they call this, this is a phallus, it's worth 40 numi. Um, it's called an anonymous phallus because there's nothing here to indicate which Byzantine emperor it was minted under. Uh, they just, for this, you know, this, just over a century, all of their coinage was uh, anonymous like this. This one's interesting too in that it has a hole punched through it. This is not something that Byzantine coins typically had, although other currencies, say in ancient China, coins would, would be made uh, with with holes through them. This is a hole someone's drilled after the fact. I don't know exactly why, whether someone's fashioned this into a button or, you know, use it on a pull string or a drawstring, um, or whether they're just, this is a way to uh, keep your coins kind of organized. You know, you pass a, a rope or something, a piece of twine through this and, and keep all your money, you know, handily organized. I'm not sure, but anyways, uh, you know, this coin is, is, what would this be, almost a thousand years old? Uh, so who knows what it's been through, so. Let's turn to Western Europe. The collection is not as strong on, on sort of Western medieval Europe, uh, but I, I did pull a few uh, examples just to show you. This one, an absolutely stunning uh, English groat. So a groat would be uh, the equivalent of four, four pence, four pennies. Uh, so it's sort of a larger silver coin, very thin. These coins were hammered, so they would uh, take like a, a die um, on which the design, you know, was, and then put a put a flat piece of silver under it, put another die on top that had the the design on it, and then hammer it with a hammer to get um, the silver into the shape or into you know to form this design. Um, so very very thin. Uh, and this one is from the reign of Henry the Sixth, I believe. Am I getting that right, or is it Henry the Fourth? Um, anyways, early. This is sort of early to mid fifteenth century. Um, I'm just having a total blank. Uh, anyway, so we have the image. You know, like a lot of the Byzantine stuff we just saw, we have this like full frontal image. He's wearing, you know, his his crown. He's got beautiful hair. These kind of locks, and then it has in Latin uh, his name. Henry, by the grace of God, all in Latin. 
Um, interestingly, it's King of England and France. So Henry uh, claimed, well, it was actually crowned as both a King of England and France. The English kings for a few generations had claimed uh, France, which they had received French lands through through sort of strategic marriages um, and and had gone to war to sort of uh, hold on to and expand these these French possessions. So this coin is from that sort of series of wars known collectively as the Hundred Years of Hundred Years War, which was fought in France between the English and the French, uh, and and this coin is 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 sort of neat too in that um, on the reverse, of course, we have you know a cross again, a lot of Christian imagery. Um, but then if you note on the inner inscription, it says Villa Calvisi, which uh, is Latin for the town of Calais. This coin was minted in Calais, which is now in France, northern France, just across the English Channel. Um, this was one of the real English strongholds. And, and at the end of the Hundred Years' War, the English were defeated, and they lost all of their French possessions except for this one port city. So this one, kind of a significant one in terms of the Hundred Years' War, uh, an interesting piece of history. So I'm going to leave off with this, this last item. This is actually not technically a coin. Um, this is uh, a jetton or a reckoning counter, they're sometimes called. It's, it's a, a, a token, basically. Um, which would be used for a few purposes. The main one being, and I'll show you a uh, sort of contemporary illustration here, a woodblock print showing this is a counting board. So before the before Western Europeans adopted Arabic numerals for you know for conducting arithmetic, uh, sorry arithmetic, and counting sums, um, they had to make do with Roman numerals, which you can't do easy subtraction. You know. Uh, uh, addition, multiplication. Um, so they would use tokens like this um, and a counting board like this in a similar way to using an abacus where you would where you would you could you know add and subtract or do sums uh, and sort of more complex calculations using tokens on this this sort of board that would usually be cut into wood or or something else. So um, so you'd need a lot of these if you're doing uh, you know doing whatever, accounting for a rich merchant house or for whatever, the King of England. Um, and so there were specially made jettons like this one that were produced. Uh, this one, you know, even though they're not coins, they still have, like a lot of the coins we've seen, have, this one has some interesting religious uh, sort of imagery, or not imagery, I guess, text and, and sort of symbolism going on. So on the image on the left, the obverse, in the center there, in the sort of Gothic script, it says IHS, which is uh, a monogram for Christ. So, uh, you know, Jesus Christ's uh, name in sort of shortened version. Um, and then surrounding it, we have an inscription that runs around the edge. It starts at kind of the 12 o'clock position. It kind of goes clockwise. It says Ave Maris Stella de Mat, uh, it would be Mater, it's just been sort of cut off. Um, this refers to a very the lyrics of a very popular medieval hymn devoted to the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, um, which I was looking and we actually have also in our collection um, a leaf like a, a page taken out of a printed uh, book of hours, like a personal prayer book um, from Paris from I think 1510. And this I just noticed we actually have the full text of this hymn. Uh, right here, you can see up at the upper right. So it says hymnus, and you can see those words again, Ave Maris Stella de Mater, and then it continues on. Um, so what this translates to is, is uh, Hail, Star of the Sea, one of the many ways that Mary was described in the medieval period. Hail, Star of the Sea, um, Mother of God. So it's, it's interesting, something that they're using for such sort of secular things as, you know, counting and you know and and bookkeeping um these were also these jettons were also used for gambling purposes too um so even something as as very like everyday and profane as you know accounting and gambling token still is covered in in uh sort of religious in references to to you know the christian religion which is kind of interesting 
on the back too, the inscription's the same, Ave, Maris, Stella, um, etc. But then we have this, this cross fashioned out of flowers and fleur-de-lis, uh, these sort of stylized three-point um, lily flowers that are symbols of France. Very appropriate as this, this jetton was uh, produced in France. All right, so that brings us to the end again. You know, I, uh, I just wanted to provide a, a brief look at some of the highlights of this collection. There's plenty more though. I think there's at least over a hundred coins uh, in this collection. You know, everything from, from uh, ancient Greece right up to, you know, sort of the end of the Middle Ages in Western Europe. So uh, again, if you're interested in coming to take a look, uh, you're more than welcome. You can come to the Mount Royal University Archives and Special Collections on the fourth floor of the Riddell Library and Learning Center. All right, thank you for watching.